The book of Revelation pictures three angels speeding to our planet. They carry urgent messages of warning and hope to prepare us for Jesus' return. These divine prophecies provide us with a vivid window revealing future events for our world. In God's Word, a special blessing is promised for all who seek to understand these prophecies. With this in mind, Amazing Facts brings you A New Revelation with Doug Batchelor. Author and TV host Doug Batchelor has thrilled thousands around the world with these fascinating presentations. This New Revelation seminar is a complete Bible study the whole family will enjoy. Clear-cut logic spontaneous humor and beautifully illustrated study guides will bring the Bible to life as never before. Today's message, What You Don't Know Will Hurt You. And now, a new revelation. What happens to a baby if it dies before accepting Christ? Oh, well, that's a question that comes in typically in every seminar. You know, the Bible does not give an age of accountability. But the Bible tells us that in heaven there will be nursing babies. You read there in Isaiah, it talks about the nursing infant in the new earth playing on the hole of a venomous serpent, and they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Well, that would frighten mothers right now to have a little nursing baby grab a hold of a rattlesnake, right? But in heaven, nothing's going to hurt. Well, the one thing that we understand from that passage is there are going to be infant babies before the age of accountability that are there. Now, we are not born with a guilty record. Nobody is. We're all born innocent as far as our record is concerned. We are born with a propensity to selfishness that develops when we live long enough. You might call it a sinful nature. Babies that do not have a record of sin are innocent before God in that respect. They will not be punished. There are some preachers that will tell you if they have not made a decision to be a Christian, if they've not been baptized, they're going to be cast into hell. The Bible doesn't teach that. Question number two, why do I feel so guilty even if I'm a Christian? Well, you know, I don't know the heart of the person asking this question. Um, Sometimes the devil wants to make us feel guilty. Just today, I was reading the story when Martin Luther was suffering from a, a severe illness. He was on his bed of sickness, and the devil appeared in his room with a long scroll that he unfurled. And Martin Luther looked at the scroll, and on the scroll was a long list of all the offenses and terrible sins of his life. And he saw that, and his heart was overwhelmed with a sense of guilt and, and uh, failure and, and the terror to think that he would have to face God with this record. And then it occurred to him something was missing from the list. The devil's hand was over something at the top of the list. He said, what's, what's that under your hand? Move your hand. And the devil reluctantly moved your hand, and it said, all covered by the blood. He said, get out of here, devil. And the devil disappeared and took his list with him. The devil sometimes wants to discourage us who are true Christians by bringing up our past. Now, if Jesus forgives you, then what right do you have not to forgive yourself? The only way I can stand before you and do what I'm doing now is because I believe by God's grace I have been forgiven and I'm a new creature. Now, I still remember the past. And you can't prevent some of those old things you're ashamed of from coming into your mind, can you? In the same way you cannot prevent the birds from flying over your head, but you can prevent them from making a nest in your hair. I have no problem preventing them from making a nest in my hair. <laughs> <laughs> All right, done. Number three, what does the Bible mean when it says there will be two in the field, one shall be taken and the other left? All right, turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17. And why don't we go to verse 34. Now, in your seminar Bibles, that's page 1528. This scripture is often used to uh, speak about the secret rapture. Verse 34, I tell you in that night, speaking of the second coming, the day of the Lord, I tell you in that night there shall be two men in one bed. One shall be taken, the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, the other left. Two men shall be in the field. One shall be taken, the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Wherever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. 
Now, instantly people assume the one taken is caught away by the Lord. But you read the context, they're saying, where? Where are they taken? He's talking about where the vultures are. You know, the Bible also tells us in Matthew 24, the people in Noah's day, the wicked, knew not until the flood came and took them away. Who's taken away? The wicked are taken away by the flood. So you've got to first know who is taken away. Now let's talk about what does it mean two women grinding at the mill, two men sleeping in a bed, two men working in a field. These are very clear Bible symbols. What is a woman a symbol of in the Bible? How many know? Church, I heard you say that. It's all through the Bible. A woman is a symbol of a church. Revelation has two prominent women, a faithful and an unfaithful church. Two women grinding at the mill. They're taking the grain and they're grinding it. What is the grain that the church works with? What is the seed? The bread. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but every word of God, okay? Two women outwardly doing the same thing. One is doing it right. One is taken away in judgment. Two men sleeping in a bed. What is sleep a symbol of in the Bible? Jesus said, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. What does that mean? Dead. The Bible says Stephen was stoned and he went to sleep. How many kinds of people are asleep right now? The Bible says there'll be two resurrections. Jesus said resurrection of life, resurrection of damnation. First resurrection and second resurrection. Okay? Two kinds of people sleeping right now, saved and lost. One will be taken away in judgment. The other one will be saved. Two men working in the field. What is the field? Jesus said the harvest is great, the labor is a few. The field is the world where the sower sows the seed. How many kinds of people out there doing mission work right now for the Lord? Two, the true and the false. Jesus said there's only two roads, right? There's only two masters. That's why he said two. One is saved, one is not. That's what it's talking about. The two women, the two men in the bed, the two men in the field. Now we move to the questions that were turned in just last evening. On as the many back, as we can. Uh, on the backs of envelopes. Oh, pardon me, Pastor. If we do not cover your question, we're trying to cover as many as we can. Sometimes we pull it because we know it's coming later. Sometimes you may just have to write it down again. And so be patient, okay? From your archaeological exploration. Have you done archaeological exploration? In my backyard. All right. <laughs> Here's an interesting question. How old was Eve when she ate the fruit? She's just a baby, maybe six months old. <laughs> That's amazing, full-grown babies. Now, there is some evidence in the Bible that Adam and Eve had probably lived maybe less than a year when sin entered our world. And one reason I know that is God had just commanded them in a perfect world to do what? Be fru fruitful and multiply. Well, they hadn't had a chance to multiply yet. And so chances are that sin came into the world shortly after the devil brought a blitzkrieg into the Garden of Eden. He caught them as quickly as he could. And I think that shortly after creation is when they were overcome. Staying in the garden, here's another question. Why was the serpent cursed? It was just an animal. It was not responsible. Well, that's a fair question. Someone might be thinking, you know, why did God do that to the snake? They weren't responsible. It was just possessed by the devil. Well, that's true. And keep in mind that not only was the serpent cursed, but when sin entered the world, man as the king of the world, he transferred sin to all the creatures. Lions didn't kill little lambs in heaven, did they? Not only was the serpent cursed, all the animals were cursed. But uh, maybe the serpent got it because it was slimy. I don't know. God was trying to illustrate a point. All right, here's the next one. What would happen if while we were living in the new earth with God, someone else turned against him? Is that impossible? In other words, can sin start all over again? We'll address that in our lesson tonight. Okay. God said, love your enemies. So does he love the devil? And if so... There's a word missing. I would, I would assume it means, and if so, why? Well, when Jesus said, love your enemies, he was speaking in context of our relationship with human beings, not demons or devils. No, we're not supposed to love the devil. Matter of fact, the most important thing a Christian can do is love God and hate evil, and the devil is the epitome of evil. The Bible says Job was a perfect and upright man, one that loved God, feared God, and hated evil. 
Here's a person who was so eager to ask the question, he or she ripped the cover off the ticket coupon and book, <laughs> and here comes the question. If God loves us so much, underline the word so, why does he allow tragedies to happen to innocent people? Well, God doesn't want anything bad to happen. Now, we talked last night, we're all under a death penalty, isn't that right? Instead of asking the question the devil wants us to ask, whenever something goes wrong, we say, why did God let that happen? What we ought to be asking is, why do I have so many blessings? Why is God so good to me? Because we all deserve death. We've rebelled against our Creator. This world has been kidnapped by an enemy. We're hostages to a rebel. And God is intervening in this world because He loves us. And so, when bad happens, keep in mind, read the book of Job, first three chapters, and you'll see that the devil is the one who brings disaster, and then he points to God and tries to blame it on God. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Everywhere Jesus went, he brought blessing. When God made the Garden of Eden, he made it good, good, very good. This is what God wants. This is why the plan of salvation has been activated, is because God wants to save you and me. Amen? All right, here is a, here's a longer question. You mentioned last night that homosexuality is not supported by the Bible. How do you suggest this sin can be overcome? I've heard from many people that they can't change these tendencies even when they've wanted to, and even by asking God to change their orientation. Well, there are a lot out there that would say there's nothing you can do, that's the way you are, you can't change, but I don't believe that for a moment because I know people who have been homosexuals practicing the lifestyle. Jesus got a hold of them, not only changed their patterns, but changed their feelings. And they travel around and share with other people how they can get the victory. But my answer would be, it's the same struggle. You know, we struggle with the flesh, don't we? Now, I'm a heterosexual, but I have to control my desires. I'm a married man, right? The same way anyone would control their desires. What about a single man who's a heterosexual? Doesn't he need to control his desires if he's a Christian? Yeah, we all have desires. Some of us are married and our problem is food. Say amen. amen. We got to control our desires, don't we? You know, we wrestle with three temptations. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Every sin falls into those three categories and Jesus was tempted in those three areas and he overcame. Amen? That means everybody can overcome. Can a homosexual do it without God's help? No. How much can we do through Christ? All things. And I believe that. All right, two more questions. Is it right for a person who's been baptized to be baptized again? There is a Bible example in Acts chapter 19 of a rebaptism. Uh, we'll talk about that more another night, but there is Bible reference for that. What will happen? Last question. What will happen to a pregnant woman when Jesus comes back? She'll be delivered. <laughs> she may deliver a full-term preemie. Well, I'm so happy to see everybody here tonight. Any here for the first time? Let me see your hands. Oh, bless you. We're so glad you're here. Where have you been? And we hope that you continue to come, do your lessons from night to night. Tonight's lesson is dealing with what you don't know will hurt you. You know, you've heard it said before that ignorance is bliss. Well, that may be true in some respects, but it is not true in spiritual matters. We need to educate ourselves about what the purpose of life is and better understand this titanic battle between good and evil. Now, in the lesson tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about the origin of evil where it came from, why God allowed it, who the devil is. And I, I want to preface my remarks by saying, I don't want to give glory to the enemy. But there is good reason that we need to study and understand what his tactics are. Even football teams, when they're going to take on a worthy team, they get videotapes and film and watch their plays and study their moves. Boxers do the same. And if people in the sports arena do that, how much more should Christians be aware of what our adversary is up to? We ought to study what the Bible reveals. The Bible has a lot to say about the devil, doesn't it? That's because God wants us to be aware of what's going on out there. You know, this is one thing almost every religion of the world holds in common. 
every religion recognizes that there's a battle going on between light and darkness good and evil and you know one reason I believe in God is because I know there's a devil the whole first 17 years of my life I was his slave I know he's real too many things happen that were supernatural there is a power of evil in the world today and thank goodness God is still alive too question number one with whom did sin originate did God make sin you read in the Bible first John chapter 3 verse 8 the devil sinneth from the beginning then you go again to Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 that old serpent called the devil and Satan sin originated in the beginning with this old serpent oh do you mean that God made a devil God thought you know they've got a pretty easy down in that world I think I'm gonna liven things up a bit and I'm gonna make a devil and send them down there some people have that concept number two what was Satan's name before he sinned and where was he living at that time matter of fact let's look some scripture up real quick turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 14 as soon as I find that I'll give you the page number I found it that's 1000 and well 1040 of course your pages will be in the middle of the bottom for our friends that are watching at home those here in the seminar have matching Bible numbers and you'll have time at home to look these things up Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 how thou art fallen from heaven O Lucifer son of the morning incidentally you know Lucifer's not a bad name it's a name God gave to this beautiful angel the highest of his created creatures was named Lucifer it means light bearer I was uh, doing an evangelistic meeting in a small town years ago had to go wash some clothes in a laundromat the little boy while I was waiting for my clothes to dry was on the floor there linoleum playing with his matchbox cars and I struck up a conversation with him and said so what's your name without looking up he said Lucifer and I said so I guess your parents don't go to church I mean biblically it's not a bad name not one I would pick it must be a, a new age name how thou art fallen from heaven O Lucifer son of the morning now his name has been changed to what Satan the word Satan means adversary sometimes we call him the devil drop the D and what do you have evil that's what he is how thou art cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations for thou hast said in thy heart are you reading with me verse 13 thou hast said in thine heart I will ascend into heaven I will exalt my throne above the stars of God I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north I will ascend above the heights of the clouds I will be like the Most High what did the devil want he wanted God's position yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit and there's more there let's go on you'll also find some more in Ezekiel 28 number three what was the origin of Lucifer what responsible position did he hold and how does the Bible describe him Ezekiel 28 and I'm going to start with verse 11 Ezekiel 28 verse 11 moreover the word of the Lord came unto me saying son of man take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say to him thus saith the Lord God thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty now you think oh, what's this Doug this isn't talking about the devil it's talking about the king of Tyrus you'll find that some of these Bible writers that wrote in this apocalyptic language they would start out talking about this evil king the king of Babylon or the king of Tyrus and then their mind went to the power that was behind that king and that's what's happening here as you read on you can see the prophet is transferred behind the scenes to the devil thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty thou hast been in Eden the garden of God now the king of Tyrus was not in Eden he's talking about Lucifer every precious stone was your covering the sardis topaz diamond the braille the onyx the jasper the sapphire the emerald the carbuncle and gold thy workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created it's believed by many Bible commentators that Lucifer has a tremendous power of music as the highest of the heavenly angels he used to lead the choir could sing four-part harmony all by himself he understands the power of music now to pause right here and say a word about that what the devil does 
He is a master of taking everything good that God has made and perverting it and using the power for himself. Who invented music? God did. It's meant to be a blessing. Can music and the power of music be used for evil? Yeah, we've seen what happens when you attach the wrong kind of music and the wrong kind of words and it can be hypnotic in its nature. And young people get addicted. Some people get addicted to this music that almost puts them in a, a trance and then these suggestions are just uh, diabolical. Remember a little while ago a song came out when I was a Christian, before, just before I was a Christian, I was in a pool hall. The song was real popular. And uh, here were the words. If it feels good, do it. Uh. If it feels good, do it. Uh. Very profound. <laughs> Whatever it is, do it. Do it. And people were doing a dance called the bump, where they bang a certain part of their anatomy together. Now, you get that with a heavy rhythm. Do it. Do it. What do you think that does to young people? They're raised with a certain amount of moral of what's right and wrong, and all of a sudden these suggestions start hammering away in their mind, and a rhythm like that sticks with you even when the song stops playing. And it starts having subliminal effect on you. The devil understands the power of music. Thou art the anointed cherub. Now we know who this is talking about, don't we? Verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. He had a position by the throne of God, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. All right, now this is very clear. Not born, but created. The angels are not born. People procreate. This angel was created. Was he created with a flaw or a defect? Now everybody always thinks, well, God must have done something wrong, right? I mean, obviously... Satan had some wires crossed or this never would have happened. God knows all things and God must have wanted it to happen. How many of you have wondered these things before? Am I the only one? Did God mess up when he made Lucifer? Beautiful angel? Couldn't God have just rewired his hard drive a little bit so this didn't happen? No. See, there's a principle. God makes all of his creatures free. Am I right? Let me see if I can illustrate this a little better. Now, my wife's out of town, and I really, I miss her. I'm a little insecure when she's not around. Everybody wants love, right? So I've developed something to help us with our needs. Good evening, Doug. Good evening, tape player. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing fine. How are you? Well, I'm fine, too, but I think my batteries are a little overcharged. I'm sorry to hear that. How come you sound just like me? That's because you made me in your image. Oh, I forgot. Doug, I need to tell you something. We're all listening, tape player. Who all's listening? Can't you see all the people out here? No, I can't see, Doug. I'm a tape player. Forgot that, too. Doug? Yes, tape player? I love you, Doug. Huh. You're kind and smart and witty and cute. Cute? Yes, cute. I love you, Doug. You're handsome and tall. I love you, Doug. 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 I love you. Do you think I feel better now? <laughs> now, this is a very simplistic illustration. I made this tape player say it loves me. Does it love me? If it did, I could make a million dollars patenting this and everyone could deal with their insecurities, right? <laughs> the devil was made perfect. God makes all of his creatures and he gives them. The intelligent creatures are made with a very valuable, risky gift. It's called freedom. He makes us with a free will. Otherwise, we would just be automated robots and a robot cannot love. God doesn't want us down here going, I love you, God. I love you, God. I love you. He wants us to choose to love him. Well, somewhere along the way, God took the risk that one of his creatures, and it turned out to be the highest, most beautiful, most intelligent of his creations, would choose not to love God. He started thinking, why am I not God? I'm so powerful. I'm so talented. I'm so beautiful. I ought to have all the power of God. And he, within himself, began to nurture and water the seeds of sin. 
Now, if we could explain sin, it wouldn't be sin. There'd be an excuse for it, right? But there is no explanation, and there is no excuse. God makes all of his creatures free, and Lucifer was so free, the proof that God is good is he took the risk of giving complete freedom, even to the point where one of his creatures would try to kill him. That's real love, real freedom. What was the origin of Lucifer? What responsible position did he hold? He was the highest of God's angels. And how does the Bible describe him? That's all in number three. Let's go to number four now. And we've been talking about what you don't know can hurt you. We need to understand our enemy, the devil. What happened in Lucifer's life that led him to sin? And what blasphemous sin did he commit? Well, we just read there in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13. He said, I want to be God. He was so beautiful. His heart was lifted up because of his beauty. You know, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You've heard that before? It's in the Bible, Proverbs. Boy, I've learned that. Whenever I start feeling like I'm being successful, I get scared. For instance, on my right hand, I got a cut. On my right, no, this isn't my right hand, that's my left hand. Under my left eye, my left hand, the cut is on this hand, I just forgot which one it was. And my left foot, I've got cuts. All three times I was seriously injured, I was showing off for somebody and I fell. Two of the times with my hand and my foot, I had to sew up my own hand and my own foot because I was up there living in the cave at the time. And I'm forever reminded that it's very dangerous to be proud. A big whale was talking to the baby whale. She warned him, be careful. Whenever you get to the top and you start to blow, that's when you get harpooned. That's what also happens when we start to get proud. A Christian gentleman was bragging to a rabbi one day. And he said, you realize that one of my ancestors signed the Declaration of Independence? And the rabbi said, that's very impressive. One of mine signed the Ten Commandments. As soon as you start feeling good about yourself, God's going to bring someone else along. Now, you know, another thing that we need to remember is that there's a scripture that says it's harder for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. I think it's also safe to say it's very difficult for a beautiful person to get into the kingdom of God, especially when they hear everyone telling them how beautiful they are and inspiring pride, conceit, and vanity within a person's heart. I knew this girl one time, that uh, very pretty girl. Problem was, she knew it. Her literary intake was reading Glamour magazine. Whenever she walked by a store window, she was always watching herself. Wherever she was sitting, she's flipping open her compact and checking her makeup. I mean, all of her friends joked about her because she was so vain. Guys liked to take her out so they could show her off, but none of them really wanted to marry her because she was so involved in herself. Kind of like, you know, my mother was in show business and sometimes there'd be these actors would come to these parties and they spent all the time talking about themselves. One movie star was at a cocktail party and she's just talking about herself for hours. She finally realized it and she said to her friend, I've been spending all this time talking about myself. Let's talk about you. What do you think of me? <laughs> well, that's how the devil is. He's just preoccupied with himself. Number five, what happened in heaven as a consequence of Lucifer's rebellion? The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 9, there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought, and the dragon, and his, I'm sorry, Michael and his angels fought the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven, and that great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. How much of the world does he deceive? He was cast out into the earth. What is deception? Deception is not just an outright lie. Deception is the commingling of truth and error. Deception is when you take some points of truth and mix error in. Now, you know, there's a lot of religious people in the world today and I think everybody here agrees that not everyone that says they believe in the Bible and Jesus is going to heaven. A lot of people have been deceived. We saw a little while back 
how some false Christs like Jim Jones and David Koresh had scores of people killed with them because they were deceived. They were reading the Bible claiming to be Christians. A girl came to one of our Revelation seminars in California. We had it in Santa Rosa. You know, Jim Jones started in Redwood Valley, just north of Santa Rosa. She was in Guyana. She left just before they all killed themselves. She said when she first started working with Jim Jones, he was reading from the Bible. By the time they got to Guyana, they had the Bible in the outhouse, and you can only imagine what it was used for. Started out very pious and religious. And that's how, that's how the devil catches people. He uses good bait. Now, if you wanted to poison me, you'd invite me over for dinner, and you'd have Mexican food. Now, it doesn't mean Mexican food is poison. It's my favorite food. And you would not set a bottle down on the table in front of me, red bottle with a great big black label, skull and crossbones, and big bold type that says, poison, warning, this stuff will make you dead and cold. And say, here, Doug, want a drink? I probably wouldn't be deceived. But if you took a couple of drops of that arsenic and mixed it in my guacamole, that's deception. You take one part poison and 99 parts good food and you still have deception. See what I'm saying? This is where the devil is a master. You know, if you take a train track and if it begins to go out of line just a fraction of a millimeter at its angle, well, it doesn't seem like much for the first couple of feet, but if you go a mile down the track, tracks are nine feet apart. And the devil knows if he can get us offline just a little bit, as we follow these mixed up principles to their conclusion, we're way off base. That's what happens with some of these false religions. Number six, where is Satan's present headquarters? How does he feel about people? Now, you just read there in Revelation chapter 12, this is war in heaven, Satan was cast out where? Into the earth. You read there in the book of Job, there's a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and the devil came also. And the Lord said to the devil, where did you come from? He said, I came from the earth. This is describing some heavenly meeting. Satan's come from the earth where his office is. See, out of immense space, there's only one planet where the devil succeeded in enticing the inhabitants to listen to him. Outside of one-third of the angels that fell with him. That's this world. How many of you remember a parable Jesus told? Shepherd had a hundred sheep. Ninety-nine made it safely back to the fold. One was missing. He left the ninety-nine and went pursuing that one lost sheep. You realize Jesus has infinite other creatures in, in heaven. I believe there's life on other worlds. Well, we already know there's angels, right? That's life. I think our world has been quarantined by sin. Jesus left the, the protection of heaven, and he came looking for this lost world, this lost sheep. This is where the devil's got us kidnapped, and Christ came to pay the ransom with his own life. Well, this earth is now his headquarters. I ought to pause again and just ask another very basic question. Why is the devil preoccupied with tempting human beings? Now, we're talking about the highest of the angels. The Bible tells us in Psalms, human beings are made lower than even the lowest of the angels. We're talking about battling with the highest of the angels. Are you and I any match for the devil in our own strength and intellect? No. Why is he entertained with tormenting and bothering humans? I'll tell you what it is. His battle is not with people. The devil's battle is with Christ. He wanted to be God. See, Jesus is God the Son. He's got the prerogatives of God. He's all-powerful and all-knowing. He has creative power, and the devil does not have the power to give life. And he wanted that. And this rebellion broke out, and he was cast out, and now he wants to hurt God by hurting the object of his supreme love. The Lord loves you more than any earthly parent loves their children. Now, what would hurt you more? If someone held you down and tortured you, put bamboo shoots under your fingernails, took away your VCR, <laughs> or if they held down your child and tortured your child in front of you, what would hurt more? I told you last night how much it hurt to watch my son suffer. Broke my heart. Would have done anything to change places with him. The devil knows that Jesus loves us. 
He knows how he can hurt God by hurting us. And you know what hurts God more than anything? Not only our death. When a Christian dies, God's not worried. But when we sin, oh, it hurts God. And the devil knows it hurts God, and that's why he fools with us. And the more misery he can cause in this world, this world was beautiful when God made it. The more misery the devil can cause in this world, he points to everybody in the universe, he says, God made this. See all the suffering down here? Well, if he was a God of love, would he do this? Look at these creatures, they're miserable. He blames it on God. The devil will do something wrong and then put the blame somewhere else. The devil will tell you to sin and then he'll turn you in for doing it. Did you know that? He's not your friend. He said, sin, you'll enjoy it, it'll feel good. And right when he sinks the hook, then he puts you in his boat. Just when you think it's really going to be fun, then you find out that you're an addict. The devil told Judas, you'll get 30 pieces of silver. And then the devil turned him in. Judas went out and hung himself. Who do you think inspired Judas to hang himself? The devil. He'll tell you to do it, and he'll kill you for doing it. He doesn't have your welfare in mind. So whenever you're tempted, know if the devil's telling you to do something, the end result is misery. But he's a deceiver. He'll paint it in its most beautiful picture. You ever seen the alcohol advertisements? It just really, you know, I had a drinking problem before I was a Christian. And I look at the alcohol advertisements that you see in the back of magazines in different places. They're starting to restrict where they can put them. They'll have some guy dressed up like James Bond. He's the epitome of health. And the models they hire to do this don't even drink. He's got a beautiful, gorgeous girl, healthy skin, beautiful figure under his arm. He's standing in front of a $50,000 sports car, in front of a $50 million hotel. He looks like he's got the good life and he's got their brand of liquor or spirits in his hand. Incidentally, you know where the word spirits for alcohol came from? Because of the evil spirits that take over when you drink it. You ever lose your temper? You know who finds it when you lose it? The devil. You ever done things you felt like you were possessed when you lost your temper? And here you got this picture of drinking. People say, hey, I'd like to have that girl in that car in that hotel, and so they buy the liquor. Then all of a sudden they're in the gutter and they're throwing up this wasn't at all like the advertisement. I'd like to have the booze companies advertise liquor with those pictures. wonder what would happen to sales. Advertise smoking by showing somebody having a lung removed or walking around breathing through their neck. I wonder how much smoking would sell or how the tobacco companies would do. The devil paints sin as beautiful. You already know that. Number seven. When God created Adam and Eve... What one thing was he forbidding them to do and what was to be the penalty for disobedience? God told them not to eat the apple. Was it an apple? What's this called? You know why? They say it got stuck in Adam's throat when he first ate it. Does it say it's an apple anywhere in the Bible? No. The Bible tells us it was the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. We don't know exactly what it looked like a lot of misconceptions about what really happens in the Bible. You know that scripture that says God helps them that help themselves? It's not in the Bible. That's Benjamin Franklin. You'd be surprised how many things people believe that aren't anywhere in the Bible. You all know about the three wise men that came? Where does it say there were three of them? It doesn't say. It says there were three gifts. There might have been 40 of them that brought three gifts. We don't know. Could have been one that brought, or two at least, that says men brought three gifts. So many misconceptions we swallow through tradition. Number eight. What medium did Satan use to deceive Eve, and what lies did Satan tell her? What was the medium? Serpent. Was the serpent a slithering, ugly beast, or was it a beautiful, hypnotic, glittering jewel-studded, flying creature. The Bible says it was the most subtle of all the creatures. It was hypnotic in the way it moved. Now, I can understand. I've dealt a lot with snakes in my life. I used to run into rattlesnakes when I lived up in the mountains quite a bit. And I know a little bit about the nature of snakes. I'm not afraid of snakes that aren't venomous. And, uh, but I'm smart enough not to pick up the ones that are. Do you know a snake... I went into my trailer just a couple weeks ago. I've got a little travel trailer up at our cabin there in Covalo, and I went to clean it out, and I saw some mouse signs on the floor. And so I opened up this drawer, and there was a snake in the drawer. Now, I jumped pretty high. 
I mean, what had happened, evidently, is this snake crawled into the drawer and he was in a mouse nest. And as you know, the mouse was now gone. And every time a little mouse came home, snake's mouth was open. That's how the devil is. Gets you in the home to begin with, doesn't he? Sometimes the devil uses those that are closest to us to discourage us. Another thing about a serpent, you know that they don't care much for their young. I've never seen a snake lay down its life to save its babies. It lays their eggs, and in case of rattlesnakes are born live, unlike other snakes, did you know that? Lays their eggs or has their babies and crawls away. Sometimes they'll even eat each other. Serpent, the devil, does not care much about its children. And he's deadly. Number nine. Was eating a piece of fruit such a bad thing? Why were Adam and Eve removed from the garden? Now, it seemed like such a little thing. Does God care about little things? The, the principle of who you obey is the same with little things or big things. You know, in God's eyes, if you break into someone's house and you steal a dollar, you've got the same kind of heart that it takes to break into a bank and steal a million. A thief is a thief is a thief. People who steal pens from banks and places where they're signing, if they thought they could do it without getting caught, they'd steal the money. And if a person's going to disobey God in something simple like not eating from the tree, what it has to do with, they didn't trust God. God said, if you eat it, you'll die. I love you. Listen to me. The devil said, you won't die. You'll be like God. He's trying to keep something good from you. And they chose to listen to the enemy instead of listening to the Lord that made them, that loves them. It was a very big thing. Little things, or what we sometimes think are little things, make a big difference to the Lord. The Bible tells us in James chapter 4, verse 17, to him that knoweth to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Sin is the transgression of God's law. Sin is breaking God's word, and this is what happened. When Adam and Eve chose to listen to the enemy instead of God, they surrendered the dominion of their world to the devil. Number 10, what amazing facts does the Bible reveal regarding Satan's method to hurt, deceive, discourage, and destroy people? Well, for one thing, he's going around like a roaring, what? Like a lion, seeking whom he might devour. You know how a lion operates? Something like the devil. It uses diversionary tactics to catch its prey. The male lion very seldom does the hunting. The male lion will find a herd of antelope or gazelle or zebra and it'll walk around on the windward side where they can see him and smell him. He'll take a chest full of air and let out a bellowing roar and they begin to tremble and shake and they run in the opposite direction right into the mouths of the females. The devil is a master of getting people to look one way and run the other and he catches them right where he's not stupid. You know how many people out there think the mark of the beast is a tattoo? Have you run into folks like this? you realize nowhere in the Bible does it say it's a tattoo and I'm going to prove to you it's not? And there are a lot of people out there that say, I don't need to worry about the mark of the beast because I'm just going to not let anybody stamp my forehead with 666 and then I know I'm safe. I mean, come on. You really think that they're going to set up a big old line and a rubber stamp where everyone's going to line up and the devil's going to go, <coughs> oh, got the mark and I'm not going to let them stamp me. There's people out there that believe that. And the devil's got folks looking this way saying, I'm not letting anybody stamp me. And they're walking right into the mouth of the lion. He's getting everyone to look the opposite direction. We'll be revealing some of his other tactics as you continue to come. He's a deceiver. He's an accuser. He makes war against God's people. Revelation 12. He imprisons and persecutes. He can work miracles. Did you know the devil can work miracles? How many remember the story in the Bible when Moses went to the Pharaoh and to prove that God had sent him, Moses cast his rod down and it turned into what? Serpent. Pharaoh clapped his hands and in came his magicians and they threw their rods down. What happened? They turned into serpents too. But there was a distinction. Moses' serpent ate all of theirs. They didn't have any rods left when Moses left. But they can perform miracles. He slanders. The devil can quote the Bible. Are you aware of that? You know, when the devil appeared to Jesus in the wilderness, what did he look like? Now, a lot of people have this idea that Jesus was out there in the wilderness, and you'll find this in Matthew chapter 4, and that while Jesus was wandering in the wilderness, suddenly the devil appeared. Now, when you first think of the devil, what do you think, what image pops into your mind? Now, be honest. How many of you see a creature with red leotards, 
bat wings, horns, goat feet, a goatee, a cape. What color is his cape? Red or black, I heard. That's either one will do. And uh, he's got a pitchfork. And he uses the pitchfork because he's in charge of hell to make sure people are evenly cooked, right? Turns them. How many of you have seen these concepts of, of uh, the devil? Any of you ever eat devil's food cake? Angel's food cake? What's on the cover? I've seen these brands. It'll got the devil with a goatee. The devil wants you to think that's how he looks. If I was Jesus in the wilderness and this creature plopped down on the ground that looked like that and said, I want to uh, make a proposition to you. I want to listen to anything he, he asked me to do if he looks like that, right? The Bible says, do not marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. When the devil appeared to Jesus in the wilderness, he appeared as a beautiful creature from heaven as though he had been sent by the Father to relieve the suffering of the Savior there who had been fasting for 40 days. He wants you to think that he's ugly. In reality, he's very beautiful. And what's more is just before Jesus comes back, Satan is going to seek to impersonate Christ. Now keep this in mind. Jesus, God, the Son, came to earth in the form of a man to teach us the truth. The devil is taking his last card and he's going to play it at the end. He's telling the Father, he says, it's not fair. You took on the form of a man to share your views. I'm going to take on the form of a man to share mine. And he will impersonate Jesus or he'll take a human, I don't know exactly how he's doing it, or appear as an angel, and he's going to claim the prerogatives of Christ and deceive much of the world. That's why Jesus said, you need to know what the truth is, because if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived in the last days. That's why I'm glad you're making first things first by coming to these meetings. Next question, 11. How powerful and effective are Satan's temptations and strategies? Well, I just gave you that. He was able to deceive one-third of the angels in heaven. Now, most of the time, you know, when someone sins, they say, uh, the devil made me do it. Let's establish something, friends. Can the devil make you sin? If the devil took Eve in the garden there, when he was at the tree, and wrapped his slithering body around her, held her down, forced her mouth open, and pushed the fruit in her mouth, would it have been a sin for Eve? No, it's not a sin. The devil can't make you sin. You need to choose. And most of the time, it's not the devil himself, but he's operating through fallen angels. They're very real. I believe God's angels are in this room right now. I would be a fool to think that the devil and his angels aren't here trying to distract people. God appoints guardian angels to protect, and I think the devil appoints his angels to study our weaknesses and to tempt us. For most of us, the devil doesn't even know who we are. The devil in person, he sends his angels to take care of these things. I mean, he's not all-knowing like God the Father. There's six billion people in the world. Here's a thought. How many of you would like to be so close to the Lord that the devil knew who you were personally? You're not sure what to say, are you? <laughs> yeah, I would like to be close to the Lord, but I don't want any personal attention. Isn't that what you're thinking? <laughs> Number 12. When and where will the devil receive his punishment and what will that punishment be? You know, the Bible tells us the day is coming when we won't have to worry about the devil anymore. Can you say amen? amen. Now, the Bible tells us he will be loosed for a little season at the end of the 1,000 years there in Revelation 20. We'll deal with that in another study. But the good news is the Bible tells us Satan is cast into the lake of fire. You read there in Ezekiel 28, it says, I'll bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It will devour thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Isaiah 14 says, you'll be brought to the pit. Are we going to have to worry about temptation and the devil through eternity while we're in heaven? Not only will there be no more sin and sorrow and suffering, there'll be no more Satan. Is that good news? Now, someone is wondering, uh, does that mean that there'll be a chance of sin again? Read number 13, question 13. What is it that forever settles the horrible problem of sin? And will sin ever rise up again? First of all, what settles the question? As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will confess to God. In the judgment day, not only will we be judged, but the whole battle between good and evil, God and the devil will be revealed to everybody. The panorama of what happened around the scenes of the cross 2,000 years ago will be displayed in the heavens and everybody's going to see this demon-inspired mob shouting, crucify him, crucify him, the devil trying to extract every ounce of suffering from our Savior he could and all the time Jesus 
is saying, Father, forgive them. And Jesus is looking on the suffering of another fellow crucified victim. The contrast between the devil and his government and Christ and his government will be clear to the universe. You know, forever, Jesus, even though he now has his glorified body, when he rose from the dead, did he still have the scars in his hands? That's one reason. It says there in the book, Nahum, sin will not rise up again the second time. Affliction will not rise up again the second time. There will never be sin again because whenever anyone, if the seeds should ever sprout in someone's mind, they'll look at the Savior's hands and they'll remember what the terrible results of this experiment with sin produced. Nobody would want to do it again. It'd be like touching a hot stove twice just to make sure you got burned. Nobody will do it again. That's the promise, is that through eternity there will be no more pain, suffering, sin, sorrow, sickness. That's why the gospel is good news, friends. There's a storm coming, but it's going to get better very soon. Amen? I'm looking forward to that day.